All right. Hello, good morning, and good afternoon, and good evening to anyone across the globe. This is Jack Barrett from Acquia. Today's webinar is named Panasonic, Serving Diverse Business Needs with One Drupal Platform. We have with us uh, Rohit Yerneni, Lead Digital Strategy Architecture Development from Panasonic Corp of North America. And we also have Dave Sawyer, Lead Optimization Strategist from FSW. And finally, we have our very own Pete Brown, Director of Product Marketing and Cloud Computing from Acquia, and he will be fielding any Q&A you might have directed towards Acquia. Also, if you have any audio questions, please send, Q &A, send them to the Q&A tab, and I will assist you right away. And if you have any questions for the presenters, please also add them into the Q&A tab, and we'll answer them during the second part of this webinar. Finally, slides and a recording of this webinar will be posted to Acquia.com and as, as well as sent within an email to you guys within the next 48 hours. So please be on the lookout for that. And without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dave Sawyer. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to go over a quick agenda of what we'll be looking to cover today. In today's session, we'll do some quick introductions uh, building off of our fabulous intro today, and we'll talk about uh, Panasonic's story of transformation. Um, we'll also talk about how they leverage Drupal to serve, to serve diverse business years using an API-first approach. And we'll take a look at some of the concepts and philosophies that come along with an API-first mindset. And we'll close with showing some of the results of, the, of this project, both from an API-first perspective and a Drupal perspective. And we'll talk about some of the results uh, of, of the project as well. Um, so let me go forward into uh, some introductions. First of all, uh, my name is Dave Sawyer. In my role as lead optimization strategist at FFW, I'm responsible for helping to provide technical solutions consulting around digital marketing optimization. And I've been working with Panasonic uh, for the better part of a year now on a variety of activities. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, if you've never heard it of FFW, we are uh, a global digital agency. We provide a range of strategy, UX design, and development services, and we're one of Acquia's leading partners worldwide. We have over 250 Drupal specialists and 120 Acquia certified developers on staff. I'd like to introduce uh, my friend Rohit Yerneni from Panasonic Corporation of North America. Rohit. Great. Thank you, Dave, and uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good, ap good morning, and of course, good evening for anyone joining from ground. Uh, again, Rohit Yerneni, I am a senior manager uh, leading our digital strategy architecture and development team here in North America for Panasonic. Uh, we are the regional sales uh, entity of Panasonic Corporation Global, and uh, my role and our team's role here is primarily to support a lot of business units, uh, which we'll talk about in detail in today's session, uh, around their digital activities, digital infrastructure, and of course, a wide variety of other aspects being part of the CMO office as well. Uh, so with that said, uh, we'll get started. Uh, our discussion today is going to primarily focus on a variety of topics, uh, but primarily we'll kind of set the primer talking about Panasonic's uh, story of transformation in recent years. Uh, and I'm sure I think you'll be in for a few surprises. Uh, over the last few years, Panasonic Corporation of North America has transformed into a much different and a stronger company than it was. Uh, with technology changing really rapidly, companies are looking to become more and more nimble. Uh, and of course, with that comes change. And change could essentially be defined in various aspects, uh, not only from a products they create, uh, the R&D that they pursue, the markets they decide to compete in, but of course in the approaches they take internally to transform the way they touch their customers and future uh, prospects and of course uh, their partners. So to, uh, this year Panasonic is celebrating the 100 year, our 100th year. Uh, of course our slogan is the 100 years of ideas. Uh, it all began in 1918 and of course the world is rapidly changing which will you know, we'll go into today and where APIs belong, but most importantly, uh, I encourage you uh, to, of course, check out our 100 Years of Ideas campaign and, of course, our properties to learn more about what Panasonic has been doing and how we are celebrating our 100 Years of Ideas. So with that, I'll jump right into our 
change topics. And change, as you all know, and maybe experiencing on your own, uh, has been accelerating exponentially. Panasonic technologies have been moving people toward a better life and a better world with that uh, the world is going to continually change. And of course, not every company or enterprise will be able to keep up. And this is a great course that uh, was able to utilize here from Google. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, if you're familiar with him, there's a great quote which says, we won't experience 100 years of progress in the 21st century. It'll be more like 20,000 years of progress at today's rate. Uh, and one would ask, what is driving all this progress anyway? And there's a great set of research that uh, many of us might be privy to and one that we'll look at right now uh, Dave, you move on to the next slide. There's a wide variety of disruptive technologies that uh, we're looking at in the industry. And of course, these technologies are changing the status quo on how trends are perceived in the market. And this particular one is from McKinsey Global Institute. And of course, these have been identified to have great impact in the industry. And these trends are, of course, creating a lot of new opportunities, trillions of dollars of economic impact. And at Panasonic, we're of course not just keeping an eye out on these trends, we're at the forefront of innovation. And today's story is more about how marketing and the digital function is helping kind of achieve that, uh, the touch points in all of these disruptive technologies. And this is a quick slide that shows which areas Panasonic is actually operating in, in the disruptive technology arena. And of course, Panasonic is a major player in nine out of 12 different uh, disruptive technologies that were identified earlier. And uh, in a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, Lauren Salata, who's the CMO of North America for Panasonic, uh, it kind of portrayed this aspect and how marketing is enabling business transformation. I'll let you take a quick read on the code. And of course, uh, the link will be available if you would like to read it more. Uh, but taking marketing to the next level to keep up with the amount of disruption that is in the industry marketplace required a new digital platform for us. And what that was really intended to was to better equip our business teams, the marketers, sales, and other functional groups to essentially touch our buyers or touch our customers, partners in a better way. And of course, deliver information they seek in a much more streamlined fashion. And of course, it's imperative uh, if you talk to any CMO or any executive from much of the larger organizations or even new startups coming up, uh, it's as important as ever to actually understand what your customers and where they are consuming information, but also to meet the market where it actually is. So that kind of drove a lot of why we uh, kind of went through this transformation journey and today specifically, we'll talk more about how Drupal fits into the mix and most importantly, what it means for marketing to compete in such a digital world and where digital technologies essentially play a, uh, a larger uh, role. So if we go into describing digital transformation, which as many of us know is a famously used buzzword, uh, which could mean many things and what I'll try to focus on today is kind of peeling the layers underneath that transformation in its own definition you can think of it is change and the change obviously brings a lot of new opportunities could be internally driven could be driven by the market or your competitors and for many companies the change could present a, a different way of approaching their business models a different way of actually trying to reach the market and utilizing digital as a big playground. Uh, I'm not going to get into statistics, but you know, a lot of interaction and a lot of decision making or consideration, as we all know, happens well before a potential prospect touches your brand or your sales team. With that, increasingly marketers have a bigger role to play in the revenue generation cycle. And with that, platforms and the approach of building that platforms becomes increasingly crucial. And the speed to market for product services is one factor and of course supporting those products and services as they are going out into the market becomes crucial. With that context in the larger uh, uh, play, you can think digital presenting a way of building new experiences for a marketer specifically. 
In today's market, marketers must continuously measure and improve customer experience across channels. And the crucial word that is across channels, your customer is not necessarily on your website alone. Digital today means various channels and orchestrating that journey multi-channel is a crucial need. And improving that customer experience can, at the end of the day, drive business growth. Uh, the idea of being able to tie in your marketing campaign down to the dollars it is generating for the business is no longer a far-fetched idea. And for most, of, uh, for most organizations, if not all, the API economy and, of course, the way MarTech stack uh, really is being leveraged today presents great opportunities. And, of course, with that, the transformation each organization is able to drive internally to achieve new avenues for revenue, but also new ways of uh, delighting your customers becomes imperative. So we can move on to the next one. So one would ask, with all that context in the industry speak, what is digital transformation, right? Uh, the first thing we would like to look at is, what does it mean to you? You as an employee of an organization, you as, let's say, a founder of a startup, or you as a large enterprise with a lot of moving parts. For some, it's solely about technology. It depends on which side of the spectrum you're on. Uh, for, for others, it's essentially a new way, or digital is a new way of lightly engaging with customers. And that is going to be a lot of focus for today's discussion and rest of the presentation. Uh, but let's complete the loop, right? For others, it could really represent a new way of doing business. And you might be seeing this uh, in fintech, in various other areas where financial industries and the large players are being disrupted by many smaller niche players who might be operating at the edge, building new services, but essentially are capturing that customer. Uh, and for an enterprise, this may mean one or all of the following that you'll see come up. Uh, it could mean creating value at new frontiers, uh, creating value in its core business, uh, could be a company 150 years old or a company that's just two years old. And most importantly, at the crux of it, how do you build foundational digital capabilities uh, to essentially support this transformation journey? Uh, the digital term could essentially be tied to marketing, but it, far, it essentially expands far beyond that initial definition. And if we move on to the following, uh, kind of a simple depiction of how can someone understand the change that goes within a digital transformation initiative? Uh, these are kind of the four pillars that we internally at least utilize for some of our activities at the transformation program. Is These are the focal points, if you think about it, uh, that transformation, mainly driven by digital, helps create, but also it's a hand-in-hand -hand relationship that the teams working, the culture in the organization helps take that transformation to its fullest extent or could also lead to a failure point. Uh, a challenge, right? Uh, how do you fundamentally challenge or change the way you operate and deliver value to the customers? It could be a very minute task that you're helping your customer complete easily when they're interacting with your brand or it could be a very large task uh, that required in the previous days a lot of effort or a lot of manual intervention, but how could digital help transform that specific use case, uh, which again, at the end rolls up to becoming a larger impact. Um, how do you integrate different digital technologies from all areas of the business? Uh, this kind of ties back to the foundational capabilities that we touched on earlier. And fundamentally, a horizontal thread that runs throughout this exercise, which is fairly typical for a change uh, management project, if some of you are from that level, that side of the spectrum, experimentation. Uh, we all talk about agile, being agile. Uh, it's less of a process, it's more of a mindset, and with that comes how do you experiment faster, how do you learn faster, and get comfortable with failure. And digital presents a great way to essentially test, learn, and repeat, and improve continually. And digital transformation uh, essentially you know, relies on that thread being successful throughout the exercise. And that requires, of course, a fundamental shift in thinking. Uh, for a large organization with thousands of moving parts, how could you essentially approach uh, 
the change and the experimentation. Here's a quick blurb from McKinsey, which uh, I really like personally, because it presents a consumable way of understanding what digital transformation uh, could look like, but also how does an enterprise approach it. And the, the summary of it is it essentially requires a different model for managing enterprise architecture, but also managing the various moving parts within an application stack. Uh, this is one way of talking about the elements of an enterprise architecture and how various aspects, all the way from an operational framework down to the bare bones stack and technology that you choose, uh, impacts that shift in thinking, but also impacts your agility as a result of that. And if you break it down, the evolution uh, model, as many of us have been uh, familiar with, if you know, you've started in the .NET or even the prior era down to now where you're probably interacting with uh, really large cloud vendors with really less amount of effort and less amount of resources assigned to it to manage big data centers. Uh, the monolithic way of building and coupling an application is shifting towards a more decoupled, uh, perpetual evolution. And uh, you know, if you are part of the Drupal community or probably the open source, you might be hearing decoupling uh, quite a bit used in various contexts. But if you take it down to a very high level, the transformation and the change, the experimentation cycle is really interdependent on how you eliminate the dependencies among various elements of your technology stack. Because you do not want to have a monolithic architecture stopping you from resolving a business problem or stopping you from achieving that business scale faster than your competitors. So this is a good high level, uh, I would say, a, a framework that helps someone to kind of think of how do I transform my singular application or a set of applications which roll up to helping you deliver that customer experience. And of course, technology is part and parcel of that overall mix. Uh, if we, and that's the back end of it. And if we think about putting it into a customer experience context, right? Uh, putting it into the context of a marketer's day-to-day. -day. The new era of customer experience and the types of transformational efforts that make up that experience journey could be bucketed into these five big blocks. And this has served well in our exercise recently where we kind of fundamentally thought through our approach to projects in a fairly simplistic way. Uh, because transformation doesn't need to be very complex when you're trying to explain it. it. The implementation, sure, could have many moving parts, but the first and foremost really lives within how you enable an experience easy enough and straightforward enough that your customer is able to consume or interact with your product or service or website, for that matter, in a much easier way. So the dimension of today's customer experience, user experience, very well lies ahead of much of the other aspects uh, because you're putting the customer at the center of much of the things you do. API first approach, how do you, if you are an organization that sits on a lot of data uh, of your partners or your customers or even future prospects that you're helping them interact better, how could APIs and the up and coming technologies help you enable that interaction faster but also in a more streamlined way, uh, reducing the amount of repeated interactions you need from a customer to achieve a single task. Then multi-channel campaigns or even a multi-channel infrastructure with a view towards omni-channel. Adopting a sensible strategy, a realistic strategy that allows you to address an ongoing digital disruption while of course staying true to your overall strategy and motive which is delivering a unified customer experience regardless of where your customer is in the digital touch point or journey with your brand. Um, digital platforms like Drupal and other uh, competing or even complementary applications come into play to help achieve that goal. And I would say help accelerate that overall vision and goal. Uh, it could mean business digital platforms are not always supposed to be uh, achieving this big macro use case, but also should be flexible enough 
to meet, to help meet a very micro use case that part of the business team or part of the product group is trying to solve to help become more agile, to help deliver a specific value to the customer. And at the end of the day, uh, as is true with any other function within a business uh, and the industry, data and the ability to visualize. Uh, unless you know how your assets are performing, it is hard to assess and reassess and deliver continuous value down to your, uh, your user or your customer. Uh, so kind of summing it up, various dimensions that we talked about and how they impact today's customer experience. And if you can roll it up, digital transformation in its essence uh, could take various flavors, but of course we're touching on today a very specific topic around customer experience. So today's focus, uh, with that said, we'll talk about two specific buckets out of that five big pillar matrix. The first one is how does a business like Panasonic or an enterprise that uh, has so many moving parts really serve the business needs uh, at the end of the day, uh, however complex, or simple they may be, and how do you be nimble enough uh, while building a platform or while sourcing a platform so you can scale with the business as opposed to the technology becoming a barrier for achieving that scale. So with that said, we'll talk a bit more specific around how Panasonic's journey went. Uh, as with any project or as with any large transformation exercise, uh, you need to be able to explain that to your stakeholders and of course explain that to your uh, project teams. And of course, your customers need to be able to you know, understand what you're trying to do at the end of the day or your shareholders. And our mission began for this specific program with very simple statements. Number one, we, would, we wanted to go out there and create a best in class integrated digital marketing toolkit. It doesn't necessarily mean it's one single piece of the stack or piece of the puzzle that helps solve every problem. Uh, how do we build an array of tools that will help us take the Panasonic brand awareness into the market and of course into every step of the customer life cycle? And the next one is how do we provide customers at the crux of it, a very seamless interaction with Panasonic's offerings, wherever they are on any device and at any point in time. Uh, the, the simplicity of you know, defining the mission, uh, we still feel stands true to helping uh, getting on board uh, a lot of stakeholders in the process, because at the end of the day, this is a big change management exercise for any company embarking on a similar journey. So with that mission statement uh, and with an idea in mind around what does API first mean and how can someone essentially start a project or start a migration exercise without actually knowing the end solution yet, but thinking API first. So one would ask what are really the dimensions of an API, API first approach? So we tried to kind of look at a lot of sources, our own experience, and you know, summarize it in a simple uh, way that you can take back at the end of this webinar and utilize it in your day-to-day -day, uh, work. So an API-first approach, in its essence, involves the design and planning of the API at the outset of a digital initiative, but not as an afterthought. So think of it for a second. Uh, we're all used to looking at various uh, projects that have integrations or APIs as, a, as one of a milestone in a larger initiative. Uh, but API first, in its definition, is how does someone or how does a project team think of utilizing APIs or think of APIs themselves in the beginning of the process and of course throughout its life cycle, but very first, how does someone think about it? And if you feel the layers, it comes down to ensuring data interoperability. How do you ensure reusability of the assets? And how do you decouple certain functions of an application or certain specific components of the overall infrastructure so they can be utilized later, but of course they can be put into more composable buckets to help your journey uh, go forward and of course reap ROI in the long term. And in the context of Drupal, 
API first, of course, as uh, quoted in the Drupal API first project, means making the data stored and managed by Drupal available for other applications within an enterprise or within different use cases as you uh, build on them. And one would ask, why should I be looking at uh, an approach like this? Uh, if, if some of you are from a project management background, uh, you, know, you hear a lot these days, waterfall, agile, scaled agile, uh, so the way we like to think about it, and of course Dave, you'll chime in later, is API first or API led, or just thinking about APIs is essentially a way of, it's an approach, it's a way of thinking when you're embarking on an initiative, uh, however small or large. If you're building a platform or a simple website or a service for some internal use case. Uh, and the benefits someone could get out of something like that is new APIs and essentially those assets can be built connecting to apps quickly and of course the right way. You could package data or package certain types of assets within an application for easier consumption, quick access, and for of course longer reuse. Easier management and operations, uh, one would ask as I am uh, building a lot of these assets and opening up my data um, there's, of course, a risk around privacy, there's a risk around governance, there's a risk around its uh, sustenance in the business. So APIs definitely provide a better way to package data, but of course, applying necessary policies on top of them becomes even more crucial for an uh, in-house IT security team or uh, you know, customer data privacy, and of course, at the end of the day, keeping your applications themselves uh, living and breathing so they can support the business. Uh, and of course, distributed capabilities. Uh, if you think of APIs, uh, this is, a, I think, a, a, an industry code that goes really well uh, for someone who's trying to understand what are APIs. So if you think of what uh, the, uh, the legacy approach of hosting and data centers and management of that, and now the move to IPaaS and uh, SaaS type of applications did to IT, where you're actually leveraging a lot of these front-end uh, vendor companies, building IPaaS um, infrastructure uh, to give you scale immediately without having to worry about a lot of the back end of it. APIs are a way for an enterprise to think of it that way. So APIs could become the IPaaS that, that became for IT uh, for developers, where you are essentially interacting with more front-end capability to help build your own application as opposed to worrying about the entire stack from ground up. And with that said, what types of APIs uh, are there? Uh, and I'm not talking what type of API or uh, connectivity technology like REST or so, et cetera, that many of you might be familiar with, but from a context of strategy and implementation, how does someone uh, go about starting an API-first approach and a project uh, based on that. Uh, you'll hear a lot from the industry uh, and a lot of different companies providing applications to support APIs. Uh, but here's a quick gist of what uh, I feel was easier to consume and it came a long way when we embarked on our journey. From a strategy perspective, uh, it is crucial to understand what type of an API you're actually embarking to build. Uh, is it an interaction-driven API? Is it actually a service? Or is it API as a product in itself, which you might be seeing with a lot of newer uh, companies that are coming out in FinTech or other areas where APIs as products are becoming more and more available, or bigger uh, established companies making those types of products available and APIs are essentially treated like their own products that you can monetize down the road. Um, Services, uh, these could be essentially internally focused in some cases where you're building services to help enable the transfer of data or even build uh, certain types of applications using those services. And interactions could mean if we have mobile developers on the call today, you can almost think of them as a collective group of APIs that are packaged up, uh, or you could leverage those as an SDK or some shape or form of a collective composed package of APIs uh, that you're building or leveraging 
as a result uh, to build that interaction. So these are, again, at a strategic level, thinking high level, how does someone even take in an exercise like this? It's very crucial to kind of bucket your use case or your <coughs> set of APIs to belong to one, two, three, or all of these, uh, and then taking it uh, into the actual implementation mode, what types of APIs do you end up building, right? Uh, you could actually have experience APIs, you could have process APIs or services APIs that kind of uh, leverage uh, much of your underlying system data, and also product APIs, or in some cases, system APIs. System APIs are essentially ways of unlocking data at a granular system level. So let's talk about uh, the top first one, uh, strategy APIs, right? So if you move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so how can someone think API first? And this is a, you know, we've referenced a, a really great uh, representation from Google Clouds Next, which really talks in a very simple way, what types of APIs exist from a overall uh, strategic thinking perspective when you're embarking on a journey. Again, same principles, interactions, services, products, but also how do these three play in the larger scheme of things within a company or even in an overall ecosystem? And ecosystems, by definition, could be the one of these four or many more, depending on which type of an industry you belong to. Uh, but an internal ecosystem could be a set of APIs built among these three areas, made available to an internal set of development teams or product teams that help build new features and services for your customers, internal or external. Partner APIs, these could be uh, aspects of assets uh, built as APIs within an ecosystem that help deliver services or products or interactions to your partners, industry. These could be vertically driven, and the next one is public. Uh, you might be seeing a lot of these in the way government is making data available to its constituents and or public developers. If you are trying to access weather data, there's a set of public APIs that power this public ecosystem, which could be built on top of a certain set of products certain set of services, but always take the interaction into mind. So regardless of the big takeaway here could be, regardless of the ecosystem you belong to, uh, regardless of the ecosystem you're targeting these services against, always think outside in. And that, that probably is the biggest takeaway for anyone is the monolithic approach could be you're taking a system, you're trying to unlock its data and identify use case. But in an API first approach and a, in a successful API first approach, it's crucial to put your customer and it's crucial to think outside in on when you develop a certain service, when you develop a set of these APIs as products, as services, or and or as interactions. And if we move on to the next slide, at an implementation level, uh, this is a very quick, representation, but of course, doesn't represent everything because it may mean multiple things to multiple uh, businesses. So we leverage internally MuleSoft as one of our uh, API orchestration and mediation layer. And the way such platforms help uh, businesses uh, you know, leverage these APIs is build that mediation layer to unlock data, but also to deploy your products, services, and or interactions for other teams to leverage. So if you think about it at an implementation level, experience APIs could be powering uh, specific app interactions. It, they could be powering uh, various packaged up APIs that are made available to let's say app developers and so on and so forth. If you think of process APIs, process APIs could essentially hold much of your logic from a transformation of data. Uh, how do you compose APIs? Uh, how do you orchestrate a process between applications or even at the granular level between APIs to achieve an end use case? And at the crux of it, system APIs. 
how does a development team uh, go about building APIs to modernize, to unlock data, or to essentially build a service that can be leveraged at the end of the day by other aspects. And a good way to think about it is microservices could be leveraging APIs, uh, and there's always a distinction to be made because they could be leveraging APIs amongst themselves. And so that's a good way to kind of think of the holistic ecosystem uh, that wraps around APIs, uh, which is very much a part of the API first approach and of course the thinking behind uh, projects that go about this journey. Uh, and most importantly, as you scale, uh, it is important to keep in mind how do you uh, build tools, how do you build enough governance and how do you build security into every step of your way uh, to help leverage these APIs for future use cases and how do you refactor them as you go uh, implementing your uh, various transformation initiatives. So <clears throat> we'll move on to the next aspect, uh, which of course is a core portion of uh, the rest of our discussion today, uh, is how did Panasonic North America go Drupal 8? And what it means uh, for us from a digital platforms perspective, and what role does it play? Uh, so I'll hand it to Dave to kind of walk us through a high-level insight around Drupal, and then we'll circle back with more specifics. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Rohit. You know, I'm thinking a lot about this idea of API first, and I, I, I have to say, I come from a development background, and even the phrase API, I mean, application programming interface, is an inherently technical thing. And I think one of the, and, uh, I believe, misunderstood aspects of API first is that it's taken to be literal as a phrase, API. And I, it, you know, one of the key ways I interpret a API first is, as you started to touch upon, Rohit, is that um, before any of the technical aspects of an API integration of any kind, what you have with API first is a mentality, a way of thinking, a philosophy, an approach to thinking about the entire ecosystem, uh, which I think is really key to this whole, whole idea of, of API first. And as a consultant in the space, I think one of the things that I see a lot is silos. In other words, disconnected systems, discrete data um, that, that has value to the business that, that is not fully realized due to the fact that it's not integrated with, with other systems and data. So to me, this idea of API first is really powerful, not only as a technical concept, but as a, a mindset and, and a philosophy to thinking about the larger picture of a digital ecosystem. So thank you for laying that out today, uh, Rohit. Um, as, uh, as Rohit said, we're gonna take a look at sort of how this contextualizes into uh, a Drupal uh, platform and uh, the project that uh, FFW worked on with with Panasonic in this case. Uh, I take you to this slide here, uh, which brings an excerpt from uh, Dries Beitart's blog. Uh, Today's goal isn't to make Drupal API only, Dries says, but rather API first. It doesn't limit you to a coupled approach like CMSs without APIs, and it doesn't limit you to an API only approach. Um, and I took that quote from a blog post, which you can see uh, the link on this slide. And uh, the, the reason why is I think it speaks very powerfully to one of the reasons why so many organizations uh, use Drupal today, because it provides a, a, a real flexibility in architecture, positioning Drupal to be any number of types of platforms or driving different types of sites and experiences, giving option to the organization to use uh, a variety of approaches, um, all within this idea of, of API first. And what's depicted on this image from Dries' blog here shows an example on the top in green, whereby one Drupal platform is powering multiple uh, distinct experiences. Um, and what we see is uh, on the top in green, the, the two leftmost and two rightmost experiences are, are decoupled in the sense that there's a Drupal backend platform that's powering uh, decoupled or completely separate front-end experiences. Um, but, but also that same Drupal platform in, in this diagram is, is powering 
an experience where the front end and the back end are, are integrated. And so it's a good example of where one Drupal platform can be powering different experiences using different types of, of integration approaches. And uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Rohit, if you could speak to you know, some of the areas of focus um, with regard to the, the, the digital experience platform that, that you built um, uh, with FFW on, on Drupal. Sure, definitely. So going into this exercise, having churned through uh, quite a few platforms in the past, uh, we needed to think differently uh, in how we uh, specifically target various uh, opportunities we had. Uh, I'd like to call them opportunities less issues uh, because that's a framework that you can build on top of. And, and areas of focus, and these were a few out of various things that we embarked on this journey, where how do we not create customer silos when we embark on this customer experience journey and build a digital experience platform, essentially, of course, uh, built on top of Drupal, uh, alongside various other com complementary technologies to specifically target this mix. Uh, part of it is organizational, part of it is an approach, and part of it is, of course, how you design your overall experience itself. How do we help marketing scale uh, in the way they are able to deliver information faster, uh, quicker out to the market and out down to the customer? Uh, how do we leverage Panasonic uh, with, of course, the complex business uh, needs and various moving parts? How do we leverage a platform that could help build a true brand governance from a digital perspective? Uh, and how do we not have a very specific tied in vendor lock-in, which is again, true to the concept of uh, sustaining a platform and being able to move specific components of the overall platform in and out. So it does not impact the business in the long run and doesn't turn into a large uh, migration project every other year. How do you as a business or how do we as a business exercise control over the roadmap features, uh, but also be able to leverage a community of developers, which Drupal, of course, has a big, strong suite in, uh, community development. How do we leverage things that are being developed probably outside of Panasonic, but of course, uh, leverage the core capabilities that can help solve our business problem today with lesser investment. Uh, how do we, again, leverage API first, in its thinking that it could help us accelerate and build specific experiences, build specific, or in some cases, more broader use cases that we know of today, but also build something today that can be used later down the line uh, to solve a specific problem that we're not probably yet aware of, that our customers might face uh, interacting with the brand. Uh, how do we, again, leverage a platform that helps us uh, collect uh, enough performance data around the application, but also uh, work hand in hand uh, to personalize the specific experience that the user is taking at the point in time, at the point of need, uh, and deliver to them a very good information set uh, that can help them uh, complete the visit faster and get to what they are trying to achieve at that moment. It could be a salesperson, it could be just downloading an asset, and or uh, looking at certain types of information that the brand is presenting at various levels of the business. And uh, last but not least, uh, as is kind of summarized in the code, we were not going in to build a website or a set of websites, uh, which uh, you could see in the earlier uh, representation uh, of Drupal's API First project is how do you build a platform that helps you deliver uh, value back to the business in its macro use case format? But of course, how do you leverage that very same platform in the long run to solve very specific micro use cases? Uh, and Drupal 8, of course, fit into that uh, strategy and vision overall. And of course, we call it the overall digital experience platform because there's various elements that go into it. And of course, uh, Drupal plays a key role in that mix. And if you move on to the next slide, uh, we try to summarize this project and I'll uh, you know, you know, go in on a high level, uh, but there were very specific highlights of the overall exercise. 
as you can see, uh, as with any enterprise level, multi-dimensional uh, project, uh, there's of course a core identification of needs uh, and the typical life cycle. Uh, what we did different this time was how do we keep uh, these various work streams working together within a limited set of time. So this overall initiative took about six months uh, with a set of different milestones and key uh, roadmap items that we wanted to hit. And the selection of technology, the selection of various components of the stack, and most importantly, the approach. Uh, agile delivery, uh, which is again fairly standard, but most importantly, how do you leverage the API first methodology to help accelerate the speed of development? Uh, projects of this format where you have various business units involved, you're migrating in and out of various technologies and content, and of course, the overall user experience uh, transformation on top. It is crucial to minimize the amount of uh, rework that you would have to put in as you're building a specific asset within the platform. And API First presents that opportunity uh, because again, you're putting an outside in perspective. You're thinking, how can you build a service or build a product or build an interaction specific to solve that problem but of course, how can you mediate various available APIs and or new APIs to uh, target that interaction use case? So again, uh, a simple way of saying various things go into uh, marrying up your business priorities and the development slash implementation approach. And part of that exercise I would kind of highlight in this whole mix is uh, the blueprinting exercise that we embark with Acquia and of course FW and internally uh, to identify a path forward to solving this specific uh, macro use case for the business with a view towards reuse and uh, you know, uh, more ROI back to the business in the long run. Great. And uh, of course we wanna close with some outcomes and I'll let Dave uh, chime in uh, as well. Great, thank you. Uh, so the, this uh, this slide summarizes some of the, the key outcomes in terms of what was uh, produced as part of Panasonic's public web transformation. Uh, one of the themes that you see represented here has to do with reuse. And I know Rohith, you mentioned earlier how important it is as for organizations uh, who are embra uh, um, embracing digital transformation initiatives. Um, to, to embrace experimentation and testing and um, learning from failure. And I think one of the things that's associated with that is building reusable pieces that can be rearranged and reused over time. Um, and so one of the key com components and outcomes of, of the project involved uh, a UX design process that was based on atomic design philosophies. In other words, component-based designs, uh, designing individual smaller components that can be assembled up into uh, larger uh, so-called organisms. Um, uh, similarly, the Panasonic uh, platform that was built in this case is built on Drupal 8 um, and was built also to be reusable and modular in nature uh, to support Panasonic's own needs as they grow and change over time. And, and API first, of course, uh, again, about reuse uh, uh, and making data uh, interoperable, integrated, and and useful. Other outcomes included um, uh, integration with uh, personalization uh, features and decision engine capabilities, search with cognitive services, uh, uh, progressive decoupling, so the, 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 the site which we'll show on the screen at the end of the webinar um, is built using a progressive decoupling approach um, and has embedded web apps inside of a responsive design implementation. Um, and we saw that um, in the near time frame after the launch of the platform, um, there was a real extensive adoption. I, I think um, Rohit, you had shared with us uh, about a five-fold increase in terms of um, engagement and participation with, it, with the stakeholders and, and sort of content contributors within your organization. And um, you know, we, we see uh, a number of other benefits uh, as well in terms of allowing uh, stakeholders to have more direct uh, access to their content uh, online. Uh, Rohit, anything you'd add? 
Uh, no, I think that summarizes it very well. And uh, again, uh, the key aspects there is, of course, the approach, uh, the atomic design systems, which uh, part of the exercise was how do we leverage a framework that helps us scale the interaction, uh, I'd say the infrastructure uh, with the business use cases, but also uh, less templatization, more component-based approach of building a specific experience that can be used elsewhere. Uh, and uh, one of the key outputs there, apart from the Drupal 8 implementation itself, is how do we leverage a design system broad enough that can be used across other digital assets in the long run? Uh, with, and of course, the overall D8 platform in the back end uh, serving that scale from a reusability and uh, essentially building more as the network of uh, sites and digital uh, application assets grow. And uh, this is a Great quote from Lauren, uh, again, the CMO of North America, uh, as you can read it. This overall transformation journey with a lot of its moving parts uh, was really meant to become and be that catalyst for change. And of course, drive a lot of transformation in the way we connect with the customers. Uh, but again, it was more of an investment towards building a platform that helps and build, uh, scales with the business in the long run. Uh, and of course, that kind of summarizes it to become that on-ramp to digital. Um, here you are looking at uh, quick excerpts of the platform itself, uh, powering our North American experience. Uh, but of course, it's just the beginning of a long-term journey around how do we overall transform our digital experience with the platform that's been built using this approach. Right. So what I think I'll do is turn it back over to the Acquia team to see if we have any questions from participants today. And while we make that transition, I'll pull up on the screen the website. For those of you that like to uh, visit and view the site uh, yourselves directly, you can go to na.panasonic.com. That's na as in North America, dot Panasonic dot com. Thank you, Dave and Rohit. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come across. And um, the first one is uh, with regards to API gateways and platforms. And is, are there any recommendations that we have uh, around what to use uh, for these things? And before I give the completely biased Acquia answer, um, Rohit and Dave, do you have any recommendations on that? Yeah, actually, I'll turn that over back to, to Rohit. I know that uh, you had gone through some uh, evaluation and, and selection um, during, during your process. Uh, sure. Uh, again, uh, I want to be as generic as possible, but of course, uh, it depends on the use cases that you're trying to achieve. What I would like you to take away is how do you leverage that framework we just talked about, you know, going through uh, an exercise of identifying what are you trying to solve? Are you trying to build a product? Are you trying to build an interaction? Are you trying to build a service? Uh, in, our, in, our, in our specific example, uh, the API management and mediation layer we've used as part of the experience platform was MuleSoft. Uh, but of course, that there's other players as well in the market that could be more fitting for your needs. But again, it comes down to your specific business need and what you are trying to achieve uh, for your customers. Uh, hopefully that helps, but uh, of course, keeping that mindset of um, what to look for is important. Yeah, and, and from the Acquia perspective, our cloud itself um, has a group of APIs and cloud hooks as part of the architecture of, of how we operate. Uh, furthermore, we do work with MuleSoft. They're um, uh, a partner in terms of technology um, as well. So, but again, I, I think I'd echo Rohit that it, it depends on your use case, which uh, leads us, there's a follow-up that came in through the Q&A um, just now that's uh, where you spoke of interactive product and service APIs, which to me still seems a little fuzzy in differences. Are there any concrete examples or links that could be provided to more distinctly call out the difference between the different types of APIs? Um, sure. Um, so, of course, that in itself would be a series of webinars. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. In essence, uh, what I would recommend you definitely take a look at is uh, there is a really powerful uh, kind of a summary API first in six minutes from Brian, uh, I believe he's part of Google. Uh, definitely take a look. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. You can learn it in six minutes. I'm happy to answer that by text as well, but uh, in quick way to think about it is API as an interaction could be how does a 
essentially a technology company package up a series of APIs that are meant to deliver a specific interaction. A good way to think about it is an interaction use case uh, of an API could be how is uh, or how are developers packaging up a set of different APIs into an SDK that can be leveraged to build a specific mobile app or an interaction. We could, uh, and if you think about it, uh, if you're interacting with a fintech application or if you're interacting with any essentially a digital application that might have a series of APIs that get pinged as soon as you request a certain type of information or submit certain type of information, uh, that's one use case. A product, uh, I think I mentioned an example earlier, that if you're a government uh, you know, entity or you're a public entity that's trying to build a product as an API uh, or API as a product, that is going to be leveraged and you would have a product manager essentially running the life cycle of that API product. And uh, with, you know, again, its own customers and consumers using the uh, assets that are being delivered through that API. And services, uh, that's a broader topic, uh, but of course services or APIs as a service, uh, you could think of it uh, in a typical enterprise setting, the microservices approach and various other aspects that you're building as a service for consumption at a later stage. It might be well represented with the Drupal example where Drupal could become a content service engine in the future and the APIs that you're building with an outside in perspective, how do they get leveraged as essentially a content service uh, in the long run? Again, uh, a, a topic that can go various ways and is really driven by a business's use case or the development team's use case at that point in time. Hopefully that helps and I'm happy to chime in more through text. All right, well, that right. brings us to the end of our questions. Yeah, and if you have any more questions, just feel free to hit us up at acquia.com and I'm sure you can contact Panasonic as well mm -hmm. and FFW and thank you for joining us. Yeah, and a couple of people have mentioned wanting to see the platform. Certainly you can reach out to Acquia to get a demo of the platform and how it works. Um, and I'm sure, uh, you know, Dave was kind enough to show us the end result here on the webinar and uh, FFW would be happy to field any questions in terms of the service they can do to help you set up something similar. Great. Thank you all so much for joining the webinar today and thank you to Acquia for hosting. Thank you, everyone.